What's up, y'all? Both sides of the barricade, episode 10. We're skipping nine for legal reasons. Maybe uh, soon we'll get back to what occurred in my life in 2016. 2015, I had wrapped up my tour management business. I had gone on the road with LL to mix and to eventually produce. And I was out there with a seven-person band uh, in the live transaction mixing. <clears throat> there was one story I left out, and it was close to the end of the run. We were in San Francisco. I believe I had friends there that night. Um, typical club. Can't remember where it was, but you know them. And um, there were people there that had something to say about my mix afterwards. And those people were, I guess, studio engineers um, inside uh, some college or whatever in San Francisco. Friends of the band or whoever invited them. Basically, what they mentioned was that they liked the mix, although they thought I moved the faders too much. <clears throat> Great critique. I mean, that's a great observation. But let's 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 delve into that real quick. This is going to be a long one, so just hang on. <clears throat> In a studio environment, recording environment, um, a lot of things are very static. Um, in fact, they're built to uh, keep sound so close together that it doesn't have the ability to move. Usually people are on headphones and, you know, that whole idea of recording has nothing to do with live music. And I'm going to tell you why. Basically, recording technology is a hundred years old or so, around, give or take. You cannot put a date on live music. So I just I, I refuse to acknowledge the technology a priori or uh, first. I, I will always acknowledge the practitioner uh, before the theory. Always, always. Um, so in an environment where you have seven people on stage playing different instruments, uh, they're not recording. They don't take their time. They've got 60 to 90 minutes to push all these songs through. You see people sweat. You see people dip the mic. You see so much dynamic activity going on that if you're not on top of those faders, if you're, uh, you know, letting it just set or what are they, whatever they call it, you know, set it and forget it, you know, and just let it roll out, you're the person that's going to be missing stuff. So activity is one thing. If you're looking at someone move faders and you're in a studio just hitting record and watching everything going on and maybe touching something after you get all the levels set, levels in a dynamic live show change constantly. I wasn't outside, didn't have to deal with too much wind, but I had to deal with seven people and their energy all changing in a 60 to 90 minute set. Call it what you want. So, 2016, we'll skip on to 2017. This is both sides of the barricade stage, audience, call it what you want. I've lived inside the barricade too, uh, way back in uh, my high school days when I got to see the Silver Chair show. That's a whole other story. Um, basically, I was invited to the show by the band because I was hanging out with two girls, and these two girls basically, I mean, got us anywhere we want to go. <laughs> you know those girls. I had a camera bag. My brother said, bring it. I brought it. They thought I was press. I told them I was press. I ended up getting in the barricade following another press person. The guy said, where's your pass? I said, I lost it in the crowd. Again, today you couldn't do that, but back then that's how that story went. So fast forward to, um, you know, wanting to produce and wanting to make my own music. I decided, well... <laughs> What am I going to do? Am I going to play drums? Am I going to sing? What am I going to join a band? Am I, I going to produce a band? You know, you go through all these things. I decided to move back to Florida. I'm in DeLand now. And I get a call to go drive. 
Now, the story goes like this. <clears throat> I was not driving. I'd let my CDL lapse. I wasn't interested in driving. I wasn't going back to driving. It was the off season, uh, you know, somewhere around the end of 2016. And I get a call to go tour, not to go tour, to go handle a bus from Orlando to Miami that there are two buses, it's New Year's Eve or a day or two prior, and the band is The Roots. Uh, my buddy wanted me to take Orlando to Miami, the crew, and then once the crew's done in Miami, everyone's flying home, I bring the bus back to Nashville. Very simple, short, sweet thing to do. Um, I thought Orlando to Miami was just going to be a no-brainer. Uh, let's see. I get to House of Blues. I grab the bus after the show. This is in Orlando. Uh, we stay overnight instead of leave for Miami that night. And we're at the Four Seasons at beautiful Walt Disney World Resort, Orlando. Shout out to the Roots for the love and the nice hotels. The next morning... Uh, we get up and the band is already gone. My buddy was driving the band, I'm driving the crew, we had a different leave time, they wanted to get to Miami earlier, yada yada yada. Well, unbeknownst to me, the only band member that was left behind was Questlove, the drummer, and his entourage, I believe an assistant and his girlfriend slash wife, not sure of the relationship. We leave around 9 or 10, somewhere in there, and the first thing said consensus view. I mean, obviously, we're checking out of the Four Seasons. No one wants a $25 breakfast, um, you know, with, without tip. We get a view from everybody that we want to go eat breakfast. So where do we decide to go? None but Waffle House right there on 535 and I-4 in Orlando. You know it. It's in uh, Buena Vista area. I parked the bus and realized that, you know, the 10 plus people that were going in to get breakfast, we're going to take a minute, whether it, you know, however they were ordering, it was going to take a while. I found a single seat at the bar after parking the bus, you know the bar at Waffle House, and ordered my food, ate my food, and by the time I was finishing up my food, they were just getting their food. So perfect timing. I mean, it couldn't have gone any better. So now we're getting ready to head to Miami somewhere around 11 a.m., you know, around lunchtime-ish. <clears throat> Plenty of traffic. Uh, it is the weekend or week or day or show, a day or two prior before New Year's Eve. Roads are busy. We get on the turnpike. You guys know it from I-4 going to uh, Miami. You're going to need to jump on the turnpike. We jump on the turnpike. And here's the story. We get near Port St. Lucie, Yeehaw Junction area. We're on the turnpike. I'm in the right lane, slow lane. And if you've been driving lately, you see that everyone gets in the fast lane because they automatically think that people are going to go fast. So they travel in the fast lane on purpose. And so everyone clogs up the fast lane with this mentality, leaving the slow lane wide open. Um, I was in this position once with another driver, just a little offbeat here and a truck decided to pull from the fast lane to the slow lane because no one was in it and he wanted to pass the people in the fast lane and he pulled right in front of us and I had to jerk this little car to the right on the shoulder and then back in. I mean like instant. If I wasn't a professional driver I probably would have gotten in a wreck basically and here's where this story goes. I'm in a bus. You know how heavy these things are. Entertainer coaches. I've got a crew that's eaten or have already eaten. Everybody's kind of, you know, hanging out. Some are resting in their bunks, making the four plus hour drive down to Miami. I see a truck about 60 to 70 yards ahead, give or take, maybe even 100. And then I see the back start to fish a little bit. And it's a little Mazda, like B3000, whatever that Ford Ranger is, single cab from the 90s. You know what I'm talking about. Um, it had big rims and small tires. I thought the car had been clipped because uh, I see it start fishtailing more. I've got my foot coming off the accelerator. I'm now in the shoulder. I've got my foot completely off the accelerator. 
Jake Brake is engaged. I'm slowing down, not sure what's happening up in front of me. That truck ends up spinning out, T-boning into the guardrail that I'm in uh, in the shoulder. Uh, so now I'm coming at him, but remind you, I'm going very, not super slow, but I'm still heavy and I'm, I'm creeping. I slam on my brakes. Everybody that's in a bunk or was in the back or whatever is now on their face. Some probably caught themselves. And um, I hit this truck enough to where if this is the truck and this is the bus, here's what happens. The truck is on all fours. I do this. I lift the truck up, set it right back down. That's the impact that we gave this truck. There were three gentlemen in the front seat. Uh, we come to find out they were illegal immigrants. None had licenses. The insurance was a bust, pretty much covered only two-thirds of the bumper on the bus that had to be replaced. Well, you got to imagine the 911 call sounded something like this. Not from us, but whoever's seeing this or witnessing. Tour bus, T-Bone's truck on turnpike. All right, so here we go. We've got fire. Well, the state trooper came on first, found out that there was a sprinter ahead of us that got clipped in that mishap with the truck. I told the officer that I thought the rear of the truck had got clipped by a car because everyone was so close and hitting their brakes in the fast lane. He said, no, it was a flat tire on the rear left. It being a big rim, small tire car, basically the uh, tire shredded immediately when it popped and it was riding on its rim. So it lost control. Uh, their fault for the accident. All I can remember is that once I saw the helicopter and the ambulance and the fire department, I knew that this was a bigger situation than I thought, but no one was hurt. There's really no damage. Uh, the tow truck that came along and the guy asked me if I wanted to tow, and I laughed. I looked at the bumper and there's a dent in the bumper. Now, it did shake people up. Um, I would say about a third of the people actually thanked me for saving their lives because they realized how bad it could have been. Um, the cop actually uh, should and could have done a lot worse things to me um, given that I told you I let my CDL lapse. And not my license, but the, um, the medical card. I was supposed to have it done in November of that year. This was the end of December. I didn't have interest in driving, but I was taking the chance of doing the Orlando to Miami trip four and a half hours, what could go wrong? Uh, the cavalry is what happened. They were called and, and the officer sat me aside and he said, I'm gonna have to talk to you about your license, you know, of course. Now, keep this in mind, no one's injured. So now we're all signing off, the ambulance is leaving, the medic, uh, life support, helicopters leaving, the fire trucks leaving, and the cop just basically tells me in his car, you know, your license isn't up to date, blah, 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 blah. But, and here's where it gets interesting. He recognized that my awareness, professionalism, skills kept many people from dying. Heroes are usually only acknowledged when they save something from going bad or they save a, 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 somebody from a burning building or saving somebody's life. Some people recognize that I did save lives and however I was being controlled uh, saved lives. I didn't go to jail that day, thank goodness. I was issued a uh, citation that made me go to court. It was a criminal citation um, given that I was driving a commercial vehicle. My license wasn't bad. It was just my medical card. Go figure. <clears throat> so now I'm trying to figure out what to do in music. The New Year's passed and couple weeks have passed I'm supposed to go to court blah 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 see the judge blah 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 
I get another call and it was about driving and it was for one Mr. Dave Chappelle again and I almost couldn't say no I mean I had to leave the same day as my court date which was wild because I go to court in the morning I drive a car two and a half hours to the airport rental car get in the air, airplane go to the sh you know pick up another vehicle go get the uh, yeah I don't envy uh, anyone that that travels for a living that works uh, in a logistic transportation business I, I just don't I, I've, I've been there I've seen it I've done it you can count on me to have empathy for you and your schedule um, don't be a crybaby but I get it we um, we meet in Charleston so I have to get a sprinter van from Nashville and drive it to Charleston um, this leg, Dave is out there filming, and I am hauling his video crew, uh, DP, producer, blah, blah, blah. Uh, fast forward two weeks, tour's going great. We're in New Orleans for the All-Star Weekend. Dave and Chris Tucker are doing a thing. I'm napping in the Sprinter van about midnight when I get woken up so I probably went to nap around 10 I get woken up hey we're gearing up to go and we were out of there a little before one but we had to do a 30 minute drive to the airport hotel where the video crew was staying myself included Dave was in town it was like a walk to the hotel if you wanted to leave the theater and go to their hotel but we were um, we were out there so I was napping because I knew I had to drive late Here's another thing about sleep. If you don't get your rest and you're not aware, the, these, are, these are real causes of accidents on the road is, is not being well rested. I am letting everybody load in or load their gear in the vehicle and we get on the road. It had rained at about 11, so it was not raining, but the roads were still a little wet, half wet, half dry. We're on I-10. If you've been in New Orleans, you know the stretch I'm talking about. Leaving New Orleans, downtown, going to the airport, um, three lanes. There's an area where we come up on a curve to the left in the interstate, and I see some headlights. Dimly, but I see what I believe are headlights, um, and they're facing us, and I realize there's a vehicle stopped in the road. So I'm easing over to the left shoulder, inside left shoulder, because if you're in a curve, right, let's say you're going too fast, you get swung out because of physics. This guy wrecked out because he was going too fast and came in, outside, inside, outside. So he's too fast on the inside. He hits the guardrail and gets spun back out in the road. Now he's facing us, stopped in oncoming traffic. It's late. We're probably the first vehicle on him, maybe. I don't know what people think. If you see a car in the middle of the road, do you just ignore it and wait for a car to just hit it and think in the back of your mind, oh my God, I could have saved an accident. Someone slammed in that car. That's our thought process. We get in the left shoulder. The producer rolls down the window, takes off his seatbelt, goes to get out of the car as he's saying, hey man, do you need us to call the cops, ambulance, whatever, and we hear, Aah! right into our rear. Big, gigantic Mercedes Sprinter van, full size, red cameras, all the good stuff in the back, in nice cases. We're in the left shoulder, inside shoulder, the fast lane's open, the middle lane has a wrecked car, and the slow lane is open. We have our hazards on, and we get rear-ended. This is less than 30 days from the wreck with Questlove. I can't even imagine why I didn't stick with my gut when I said I'm getting off the road. Um, 
a year or two prior as a tour manager slash you know driver in the off season. Now I'm thinking I'm not tour managing, but why did I go back to driving? Why did I do it? And the universe let me know, dude. Why aren't you listening to us talk? Us being these signs that are saying, get your tail off the road and and pay attention to music. <clears throat> so two accidents, less than 30 days. You can guarantee, even though my license was valid, I was quitting. Again. <clears throat> 